Yes, it's really me. I am here. Just so everybody knows, the 11th and the 18th of August, Ruth and I don't plan on being here. All right? Then you'll get Paul and somebody else. Or something will happen. Any questions? Everybody understands. Cool. But I am here today. All right. Uh, no communion this week. Communion is not this week. Uh, next week. Tomorrow morning, uh, prayer, 9.30. Wednesday, 6.30 prayer. 7 o'clock, we'll be back in Luke 19. Uh, about verse, I don't know, 16, 17 is where they get cities to rule as a reward for their wise investment, at least for two of them. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, this coming week. All right. Any questions there? Who wants to share the events of the week? Pardon? What events this morning? Of this morning? For this morning? Help yourself? I don't know. It's up to you. I'm, you you got to understand, I'm pretty easy. Remember you did this. Remember I did this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll pull up a chair and sit down then. I had a couple of things this week. I was telling pastor, I think, prayer meeting. I think it was a prayer meeting. Uh, some things coming up for me, and there's going to be some changes in my life. I didn't know what it was at the time. He just told me there's going to be some changes. So I said, all right, that's good with me. And they're in the works now, some of them. And uh, I said, well, what do, I, what do I do about this? And what do I do about that? And, and he spoke in my heart and says, you have nothing to do with it. <laughs> oh, I said, I forgot about that. <laughs> Forgive me for that. And this morning, I seen Paul Wiseman and his wife, and, and something went click. And I thought, hmm, I wonder what that's clicking for. And I sat down there and uh, just kept clicking. I said, wow. And the Lord says, I remember back, I'm not sure I got it wrote down at home when it happened. Uh, the Lord spoke to me, and, and uh, well, I'll say he revealed it to me, that something was going to happen. And I was real quiet, real quiet waiting. And he says, uh, I'm going to use Paul Wiseman. You're going to use Paul Wiseman? I said, yes. When he gets completely healed, that's going to be a time when things are going to really start moving. I guess in my life, in our life, I don't know, in a body. Well, you know, the next Sunday, I wanted to lay hands on him. <laughs> Get this thing going here. No, that's not it. And the next Sunday, I kept going, no, not it. And I thought, well, what, what, what's going on here? So I was patient and waiting, and some other time we was up here praying. I think it was for Sister Diane, I think. And I think Sister Beth was involved with it. And I don't even know how I got up here, honest. I don't know, remember walking up here or anything. But... Sister Beth and Sister Diane was up here, and she looked at me like, duh. And so I, I, I guess I was supposed to pray. <laughs> so I prayed, and I felt an anointing come upon me. And uh, I say I felt an anointing come upon me. I, I like to explain it like this. When uh, Brother Hagen was asked one time, oh, what, what does that mean, anointing? He said, well, and how come some people fall under the anointing? Well, he said, you know, it would be like uh, if you got shocked and you put a your finger in 110, you go, oh, man, oh, man, that was something. But he said, you, you put your hand in a 240, <laughs> you're going to go down. And he said, that's the same way it is anointing. It depends. God doesn't waste his power. He doesn't waste his strength. He doesn't waste anything. When he wants to do something, he does it. And so along with what I'm telling you about this morning is I had a, 
a remembrance of when God parted the water, when he parted the seas, and they walked across on the dry land, they put a pile of stones there. So the kids would say later, what, what are those stones, what is that for? Because that's when God parted the sea for us. Oh, and then they'd have different things that, they, that the Lord would do, and they'd put a pile of stones there so people could ask about it. And that's what I was getting over there. And he said, because, because I'm doing this, it's just a, it's just a place for me to pile, you can pile your stones there. And you remember when I told you this, and you pile a pile of stones there. And I remembered it. And when, when Paul was up here and walking by me, the Spirit said, now lay hands on him. And I laid hands on him. I felt going into him, anointing going into him. But it wasn't complete yet. It was still having a little problem with sleeping, having a little problem with this and that and the other thing. But a couple weeks ago, when I came in in the morning, and he, he laid it on your heart for us to pray about that again, that finished it. That finished it. That's over with. That's done. But he used different ones for a starting of things. And I piled my stones there. He said, that's when it's going to start. That's when things are going to really ha start happening. So, again, I said, well, Lord, what about some other things that you, you showed me that's going to happen? When, when, what do I do about that? When, when do I start doing that? When, when will I know it? And he says, you have nothing to do with it. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do with it. We don't have nothing to do with it. All we need to do is just get out of his way and let him let him do what he wants to do. Now, we give God all the glory and all the praise. And I just want to say to, this morning that coming in the near future, what's going to happen with, with all of our lives, I believe, is we're going to be desiring a heart like David. And David wanted a heart so that he had a heart after God's own will. You know, God knows my thoughts. He knows your thoughts. He knows what your ideas are. He knows all about you. He knows all about me. But now we're coming to the place where I want to know his thoughts. I want to know his ways. I want to know what he wants done. I want to know what his pleasure is in me. I want to be a part of his pleasure so that I can hear him say, Thou, thou son, I am well pleased with you. Daughter, I'm well pleased with you. I want, I want you to know I'm well pleased with you because you want my thoughts and my ways. And so I caught myself saying, Make me a carrier of your will. I want to be a carrier of your will so much that I want your will to overcome me. Overcome me. Overcome me with your will, not mine. Overcome me with what you want to do, not mine. And I want to testify. I'm going to pile a pile of stones right here. The moving of the Holy Spirit has come to us this morning. As we wait upon him this morning, Whatever needs we have in our body, soul, and spirit, my God is able to supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. And this morning, because God gave pastor the, the wisdom and the, the gifts of the spirit of wisdom upon him and the spirit of righteousness upon him, we have within us this morning the power of the Holy Spirit to direct us into the more of his light this morning as, as, as pastor is led into this. And we know him without question because, you know what he said? Where 1,500 or 2,000 gather together in my name, I'll be there in the midst. Huh? Was that what it was? Or was it two or three? Can I have two people this morning agree with me that Jesus Christ is in our midst? Is this a metaphor or is this really true? then why do we teach it like a metaphor? Why do we see he's so far away when he's in our midst? Not only in our midst, but he's in our heart. He told the disciples, I am with you, but I shall be in you. And when you see that in you, I'll deal with your heart, the consciousness of our heart. He'll sprinkle us with the things that we need in our heart so that we'll have confidence. We'll not have fear. We'll not have doubt not unbelief, anything like that. So this morning, I pile a pile of stones up here for you to see it. Our God is moving in our midst. 
And I don't care what it looks like on the outside. The symptoms don't mean nothing to me. Because we serve a God. Now my son, I'm just going to close in a minute here, but my son, we had a get-together. My son, he's got a, a doctorate degree in computer technology. He's kind of like a, where he got those brains must be from my father, because I, you know. But he said, he said, what's here, Dad? He went over to my deck around the pool, and he, around the house, and he put a, a box, black box about that big. He said, what's this? Over there. He gets his, tele, gets his telephone, his, you know, his cell phone out. Dial the number, and he said, hear that music over there? He said, yeah. He goes, boom. This thing came alive over here. Wasn't no wires to it. Wasn't nothing to it. This was a speaker playing the song he's got on his phone. I said, how's that happen? He goes, a whole bunch of words. I said, never mind. <laughs> I, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but you know, that is great. But you know what? Our God is so great. Now the scientists, they found a new galaxy a couple weeks ago, found a whole bunch of new stars, light years apart from the other. And our God knows the stars, and he knows them all by name. Our God, the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, he takes water and he makes wine out of it. He takes water we drink and he walked on it. He took the lame and he healed him. He took a Lazarus and brought him back from the dead again. That's the one that's in our midst this morning. That's the one we serve. Not a bunch of technology, but a, a, but a God that knows every need we have this morning. Let's look to him this morning for the needs that we have as we pray together this morning. Would you believe with me? Heavenly Father, how great thou art. I didn't plan anything to say nothing this morning, Lord. On the way in, I just was thanking you for this day and thanking you for the goodness and mercy and strength you give me and reminding me that I have nothing to do with it. You brought me down through the years of my life and you, you brought me through things that I didn't know anything about, but I had nothing to do with it. And Lord, we have nothing to do with our salvation this morning. You give it to us freely. You give it to us because we ask you. There's no strings attached. And the things we have need of this morning, we can believe for and receive for. And believe that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knowing that you are the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because we believe that Jesus Christ is your son, we also come to that place this morning in realization that we are joint heirs with you. And that we are the seed of Abraham. And then the blessings that's promised to Abraham there are blessings this morning. The things that you promised in the word of God, I don't care what the symptoms seem to say, but beyond the symptoms, beyond the pain, beyond the doubt, beyond the fear, comes the power of the living God. You said we would receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And the Apostle Paul witnessed it. He said, I did not come to you with a demonstration of, this, of man's wisdom, but I came to you with a demonstration of the Spirit of God and power. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For you are alive forevermore, amen. And you do have the keys to the kingdom of God. You, you have the keys for us to walk in this morning. You have the keys of hell and death. Thank you for giving us the keys of life. Thank you for putting into us this morning the kingdom of Jesus Christ that lives within us. And let each one of us this morning, whatever need it might be, plant it at your feet, knowing that the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed us from all sin. We have nothing to hide between us. We, can, we do not regard any sin, any iniquity, because it's under your blood. And we thank you for that this morning. As we all agree, is touching this one thing. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. And above all, we'll not forget to lift up the name of Jesus above every name. And everybody says, Amen. Anybody else?
You say, what are you doing? Well, I'm looking. What is the purpose of the Holy Spirit? Talk to me, huh? Comfort, guide. Edification. Pardon? Edification. Edification. Show us things to come. Pardon? Reveal what God the Father. Anybody else? John records it. John records it this way. He says, the Holy Spirit, he's come. He's going to guide you into all truth. All truth? Are you ready for truth? His truth. See, not modified by man. Man tends to modify his truth. You see, and what you get this morning, I, at this point, I don't know what you're going to get. All right? So we'll go with that. He has come to share all truth. If we as individuals modify truth, listen, I took this out of Detroit paper yesterday. And uh, it says this, since have a way of catching up to you. Have you ever noticed that? Sins have a way of catching up to you. Now, in this article, this man writes, it has some humor. It has some truth. But I believe it has some modification. And that is, that makes me nervous. When we start modifying truth, to make ourselves comfortable, we are headed down a road that we don't, we don't want to travel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a portion of this article. And he's talking about his mother. And he's talking about somebody when he was in the seventh grade that kept stealing his lunch day after day after day. He says, be sure your sins will find you out. That's what the good book says. And my mother quoted those words to me a lot of times while I was growing up. In fact, she once arranged for a public demonstration of this proverb. Now hang on, it's not a proverb, only if you make it a proverb in today's language, because it comes from numbers, all right? But it is a proverb, if you do it in today's language, of something that has a message that will happen. So. But understand, we smile, we chuckle, but is that the right thing to do? Do we make a public demonstration of a proverb over this, the, which I'm about to read to you? I was in the seventh grade. Somebody was habitually stealing my lunch from my classroom cubby. My mother complained vigorously. Still, the thievery continued. So she then did something unexpected. She took matters into her own hands. Are you ready? Have you ever took matters into your own hands? Is that truth? Is that, is that, is that what he tells us to do? Uh, so, let me read. My mother made a sandwich containing, combining dog food with greasy potted meat compost. I'll leave that to your imagination. Then she sweetened the deal with a baked brownie, x lax being the main ingredient. Yeah. 
The thought of my good Christian mother orchestrating and executing such a devious plan of revenge made my teenage heart leap with joy. <laughs> now, understand, this is my first, another disclaimer. I'm not defending the, the offending mother nor the immature lad. Because I think, what about the other cheek? Or make two lunches? You say, well, that's not, yeah. Is it or isn't it? What's she gonna do? So, on the day of judgment, look how he blends these things in here, all right? These theological concepts with this action that the mother is taking. And he's so delighted in. On the day of judgment, I placed my lunch in this usual location. I went to math class. Later I returned to fetch it to my sinister delight. I watched, it was gone. I nearly hyperventilated. You got the idea? We're modifying truth to meet our own set of circumstances and our own want to, our own emotional systems. I watched the absentee roll for the next several days and discovered that Dexter Wilkie missed three days in a row. When he finally returned to school, he was still a little green around the gills. Obviously, mother and I had our man. He went on to say other things, and I'm not getting into those. I just want to think about this for a moment. I'm also not condoning the use of biblical terms with less than biblical actions. Your sins will find you out. Mother arranged a demonstration of a proverb. She didn't just turn the other cheek. Or she didn't heap coals of fire on their head. She, in his words, a good Christian mother, orchestrated the day of judgment. Galatians 6, 8 says this, He that soweth to the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. Or he that scattereth to the flesh of the body, shall of the flesh harvest corruption. Shall decay, ruin, and then two other words it throws in there, shrivel and wither. Which do we want to do? Do we want to live a life more abundantly than the divine principles of being guided into all truth becomes the issue? Not whether I'm one up on somebody else. He that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap or harvest life everlasting. Question. Why is it we that have been forgiven find it difficult to forgive? Ooh. What is the Spirit supposed to do? Guide us into all truth, amongst several other things. Let me do this with you. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 20, says this, We have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Ye know all things. All truth resides in you. What are you going to focus on? That which makes your tingling sensations abound, or are you going to focus on the unction that is within you that teaches you or has you know all things? 
Wow. Okay. If you went down to verse 27 of the second chapter of 1 John. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth or dwells in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it been taught you, you shall abide in him. There we have promises of a God who cannot lie. Cannot, cannot, cannot. How many times you've watered down the promises of God? Hmm, you modified them? Hmm. Did it change the truth of the matter? No. Still, his promises is. You say, why did you throw these in here? Well, as I sat there and listened to Paul, I thought they would be quite fitting. If we could get to the message today, if we could get there, it's based upon the fact. Let me, re let me read you two verses. See, Romans 6. I tell you, folks, God has a timetable. And we're not going to change it. I was more aware. I listened to Paul, and I become more aware that God has established certain things. And we won't change it. All we can do is comply with it to the best of our understanding. Do I understand everything? No. Have you ever had issues? Yes. Have you ever modified the truth? E yes. Did you ever try to force things? E yes. I want that bus. Held into the promise. We got it. It was no real earthly good to us. We need to be focusing on him. What he's telling us. What he's sharing with us. Listen to this. And when I said that he has a timetable, if some of you in your memory banks remember here probably six weeks ago, maybe longer, I said, I think we're going to go to Romans chapter 6. Next. And I knew when I said it that I was a little off base. <laughs> okay? I had jumped to a conclusion. You ever jump to a conclusion? A biblical, theological conclusion. No reason why it shouldn't be. Because that's where he, you knew he was going. Yes, I did. He did. He knew. <laughs> it just wasn't out six weeks ago. Or two months ago. It appears to be directly on the horizon. <laughs> okay? Now you notice how I modified that. But listen to this. We've been talking about spirit, soul, and body, the, the, some of the, the finished works. Listen to this. And then you can stand and tell me, this is how you look at this. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin? <laughs> no. Every one of you would say, no. We should not. But. No, it doesn't say but. Should we continue? What should we say then? Should we continue in sin? Well, no, you say. Well, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? We'll see grace abound if we continue in sin. We, we can rest in the finished work of Christ and all these things. That's the way it is. But the principle of the thing is, in the second verse is, God forbid. God forbid that we live that way. You got the point? Hello. Woo. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Is that what it says? I didn't plan on going here. 
Well, I guess we'll get there. Are we dead to sin? That's what the book says. Do we dabble in sin? God forbid. Don't confess to me. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The answer is we won't, don't want to. Not even once. There's enough provision in him to live without it. Well, that means, if that's the case, what happens is you get right out on the end of the limb and then you take the saw in your hand and you cut off the limb behind you. <laughs> yeah, oops. Well, should, God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer then? No, you not. That as many of you were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Oh, just a minute. Is that, what kind of baptism is he talking about? Now, there's not a set of notes that goes with this, only in the office somewhere <laughs> of sorts. What kind of baptism is he talking about? Huh? I believe that's right. Have you and I ever preached that as being water baptism? No, because the Paul says, <laughs> Paul says multiple baptisms. He does in Corinthians, doesn't he? It was the second, is the first Corinthians chapter two or second? What does say that if you don't lay again the foundation of truth? Yep. Yeah. Baptism, multiples. Absolutely. When we're baptized into the into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his body. What is his body? Huh? The church. We're baptized into his body. His body, one, corporately, his church. But one thing is for certain, we're baptized into him, into his life. So then what manifests through us? His life. And his life is capable of facing every issue that you'll ever come across. Now, did I just duck there? Is his life sufficient to meet every issue that will hit you in this life? He lived it, and he lived it victoriously. My, my, my. Lynn, are you all right? You were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. He died, you died. We know that, don't we? Wow. Remind me where we stopped right here. Can you do that? Okay. Because I might need a lift back to it. Just so my grandson relaxes and, and comes to the place that his grandfather does recognize that he did this once before, the only thing is, I can't remember when. <laughs> and some of you may have questions. I was going to do a brief review. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Is that a truth that is real to you? That the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Free from the law of sin and death. Do we believe that? That's Romans 8.2. The first one was Romans 8.1. These are truths. This comes out of a scripture out of the end of the seventh chapter where it just looks like mass confusion to live that life. What are you going to say? Wow. We're free. I want to tell you that. We are free. No condemnation, no guilt, no penalty, etc. We are free. Paul says, he calls it a new and living way. Hebrews 10, 19 and 20 says this. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which was consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Through his flesh come your life, because he bore your sin, not his sin, your sin, in his flesh. Go over to Peter, and 
Angie will tell you what scripture. I think it's 1 Peter 2.24 or 1 Peter 1.24, somewhere over there in that area. All right? He bore, we bore, he bore our sins. Matter of fact, the sins of all the world is already forgiven. Just write that down. Make that indelibly imprinted. Is that a truth? Don't compromise it. I don't care what you're looking at. Don't compromise it. He's forgiven the sins of all the world. In Corinthians, Ephesians, he talks about it. Understand that. Okay. And he calls this a new and living way. And I look at this and say, <laughs> because what you're going to hear next is a lot of it's. All right? A lot of it's. I-T, it. Plural has a little s. It. It. The old way was nailed to the cross, to Jesus' cross. What is this it? Colossians 2.14 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That is all the ordinances. Don't hang on to a part of the ordinances. Can I make that clear to you? You've heard me before. I'm stressing it again this morning. Don't hang on to any of the old ordinances. He has given you a new and living way, guaranteed it by the death of, of bearing the sins in his flesh, to his death, to his resurrection, to his seating. Then he says, simply, love the Lord thy God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. Simple as that. It incorporates all the moral law. Because it's the moral law that people want to hang on to. And he lists them as 10. And if you did those two, the results would be the 10 is a done deal. So let me go on here. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. See what this, those things are contrary to us and against us. Is that truth? That's what it says. It's truth. No. Just shout, it's truth, Lynn. <laughs> it's truth. So contrary to, to us, he took it out of the way. Here comes your it. Took it out of the way. He didn't even say the, old, the law. The old way is what it is. Because he'd give you a new way. The old way, it, was nailed to the cross. Now hang on, because this gets pretty picayune. Well, that's the wrong word to use. It gets kind of direct. It tells you some things about this. We have taken and picked up the old way and made it the center of our message in many of today's sermons and teachings, presented and endorsed by corporate bodies and individuals. True. The old way is a disannulled way, the way against us, the way contrary to us, the way of the shadow, the temporary way, the way of condemnation, the abolished way. Now, how many ways has he got to say this to make you believe that is accomplished? Whoa. Some of us have, past tense, participated in this old way called the ministry of death. This old way that generated guilt, condemnation, judgment, depression, strife, turmoil, shame. I've graduated. Have you graduated? Amen. Some have brought it, the old way, into the church. Embracing it, embracing it with our performance list of do's and don'ts. You had done those? True. We've done them. We're not still doing them. No. <laughs> no. No, no. This is an effect, if we're doing it, it's our self-righteousness. Listen to this. See, adding it to the completed, all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Now, isn't that, isn't that blasphemous? Isn't that over the top? Isn't that, can you do anything to the fact that it is finished. Is it self-effort? 
No, it's a finished work. Wow. You guys remember this? Paul says yes. The rest of you look at me kind of blank. I knew there was a reason why I got to that briefcase I don't usually use, and there it was stuck in there. <laughs> Matter of fact, Kay will get you a copy. It's on the top stack. It's on the, it's on the top stack on the end of the desk, if you want. Okay. Oh, adding it to the completed, all-sufficient sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Adding it to the shed blood. <laughs> Ooh, that's what you're doing. Do we recognize this. We are substituting our own program in place of the shed blood of Jesus. We don't want to think about that, do we? Because, man, that gets us down where we live, and we can see that that is not good. No, sir. Uh -uh. Adding it to the shed blood, adding it to his burial, and victory over sin, hell, grave, and Satan. Don't do it. Wow. Adding it to Jesus' resurrection. No, 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 no. Adding it to Jesus' celebration of the finished work by his seating in the heavenly holy of holies at the right hand of God, at rest, representing us to the Father God. You could add something to that? No, no. What is this monstrous, crucified, dead thing we brought to the church? A discarded tool that is meaningless to a righteous man. It's a temporary tool that of God that Satan picked up and brought to church with our assistance, our participation, and our support. No more. No more. It is the law. We are to know this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, 1 Timothy 1, 9, but for the lawless, the disobedient, for the ungodly, for sinners. In other words, the curse, the guilt, the wrath, the condemnation, the judgment, the death contained in the law is only in effect for Satan and his people, his own. We have come out of that, and we now are sons of God, joint heirs with Christ. Ooh. The Spirit warns in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, not to give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. It tells you what the food that God has cleansed and purified. It tells you that if you can't eat it, you're listening to seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. Simple as that. When are we just going to flat and just get a hold of the Word of God? And when it says it, we believe it. We need to do that. Now consider Acts 10, 15. God said to Peter, what God has cleansed, call thou not common. Verse 16 says this was communicated three times. Reinforced in Acts 10, 28, not to call any man common or unclean. Peter before his, at Peter's defense before the church at Jerusalem in Acts 11, 9 through 10, the voice answered me again, from heaven. See, what God has cleansed or purged, or purified, that call thou not common, defiled, unclean, or unholy. What don't we understand about this? If God says what he has cleansed, purged, purified, call thou not common, defiled, unclean, or unholy. That's who you are in the view of God. You who have been bought, you who are redeemed, you who are sanctified, you who are walking in the righteousness of, receive the righteousness of God. That's who he's looking at. Why don't we agree with him? Don't modify it. All this was done three times. We have been manipulated. How do you like being manipulated? I get right up on my ear when I smell it coming. 
gracefully, I hope I get up on my ear. We have been manipulated by a dead law for the righteous man. It was presented with Satan's recommendation and the church's support. We let it retard our spiritual growth. They thundered. You ever heard anybody thunder? Sin, guilt, judgment to the congregation of the righteous redeemed and the cleansed. They call it a warning, a protection, or a purifying of the church. Hello? What did Jesus shed blood do? They say, do and God will. Not understanding, God has already provided his all. Then gave his all to us. Is nailed to the cross with him, the redeemed and the redeemed's old man. God through Jesus has translated us from the law of Mount Sinai into the grace of Mount Zion. We are approved to boldly enter not only the earthly holy of holies, curtain's gone, but into the heavenly holy of holies now by a new and living way. Isn't that something, though? Now, when you write something like that, you know that's not you. Okay? It just, it just keeps scrolling down, so to speak. It just keeps rolling on, and the words just keep drifting in. Where did we leave at? Where? Had it made me free from the law of sin and death. <laughs> okay, let's, let's go back. Where were we? Oh. We had more of Romans, uh, of, did we have some of uh, Roman, uh, Romans 6 up there before? Can we go back to that? We were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. Uh-oh. 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 Did you catch that? I didn't say it. That as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, what's like? We were buried. He's talking about you and I. We were buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. The newness of whose life? Christ's life. We are to walk in the newness of his life. It's no longer I that live, but Christ lives in me. Galatians 2.20. Don't modify that truth to something else. Don't let anything else get between you and that life. Don't let anything else get between you and that life. Here's a new, oh my, here is a scripture we didn't use last week when we was talking about a heart condemns us or condemns us not. If a heart condemns us not, then it would be confidence toward God, but if a heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. See, these truths are already true to God. If your heart don't understand them, hello, get them on the right page. You have the guide into all truth. You have an unction that you know all things. You have an anointing that takes you there. So, what are we going to say? Can we find first? Can we find First John, uh, chapter five, verse fourteen and fifteen? We didn't use this. This is regarding confidence, and so we'll stick it in here this morning. All right. This is the confidence or the assurance that we have in Him. Are we in Him today? He's talking about us. I keep wanting to say usins. But this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask, what? Anything? Anything. <laughs> oh, my, 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 my. 
if we ask anything according to his will, and that will we've talked about before just sometimes petrifies you or get, puts you into Because all you've heard in many sets of circumstances is the will of God. And that's how you hear it, the will of God. Huh? Oh, yeah, it's a weapon. In some cases, in certain hands, it's been a weapon. Ooh. <laughs> I tell you, it's exciting. To know, where was it? Who can quote it to me? Revelations, was it? Revelation something, Revelations 4? Uh, Revelation something, where he talks about. Oh, 4.11. Uh, can, we, can we just slide? I don't know if I give it to you. Revelations 4.11 probably did not. Can we just slide that in there and we'll come back to this one? Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory. Have we received glory? We just heard it. We was raised with glory, right? We, re we received glory, honor, and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. I challenge you, to you that has Thayer's and Strong's and various other <laughs> books, got it? Look up pleasure. And what does it tell you? It says it's will amongst things. So as the Father's good will, we were created. Don't get hung up on will. You have your mind renewed that you may prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will, good, acceptable, and perfect pleasure of God. Doesn't that, how does that ring with you? It's the goodness of God that leadeth us to repentance. Why would he take somebody outside the fold and apply goodness and use a hammer on the body of Christ? He would not do that. Would not do that. All things were for thy pleasure, and we were, are, and were created. Back to 1 John 5, please. Whew. I like this stuff. Do you like it? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears anything according to his pleasure. What is his pleasure? His divine provisions. That true? That's true. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Oh, boy, I not always, no. And the minute you do that, you stop, you go back in history. What are you saying? The thing about it is, if we've missed it, we've missed it. That's over. It's done with. I am not going to get upset about history. What did you say we were to do? Proceed and go. Proceed and go. Pick up. Move on. Look more Look closely, follow that guide into all truth. I'll be quite frank with you. I know it would be a shock to your system, particularly to bugs. I don't know all things. <laughs> but I've, I hesitate confessing that because by the same token, I said, he says, we are to know all things. Is that right? So the means to know is there. I just, have I tapped it? I leave it as a form of a question then. Safer. Whoa. All right. I'm just going to, because it's important to what we're going to share in the next few moments, I'm going to run a review of Hebrews 10, 22, and verse 35. We can have a true heart. 10.22 of Hebrews says, let us draw near with a true heart. We can have a heart full of assurance. That's what it says. 
full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Ooh, and our bodies washed with pure water. Now look, in verse 35, it says this. Cast not away, throw not away, therefore your confidence or your assurance, which has great recompense of reward. There is a return there. Do not deliberately cast or throw away the ministry of confidence and assurance. Don't do it. What are you saying, Lynn? Isaiah 32, 17 says this. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. The effect or the action of righteousness shall be peace. Righteousness is a gift. The action of that is peace. I got righteousness. I received it. It was a gift to me. Therefore, I have peace. And the effect or the ministry of righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. The ministry of righteousness is quietness or confidence and assurance forever. Do we live, walk, move, and have our being in quietness and assurance? That's how he wants us to be. We cannot afford those things which are contrary to that. You say, well, what's contrary to that? There's two kinds of wisdom, and I'm just, this, this is not pleasant to behold, all right? This is not pleasant to behold. But in James 3, let's go there. Who is, wise, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation or behavior his works with meekness and wisdom. Sounds good, doesn't it? Now, hang on. Next verse. If, <coughs> if you have bitter envying, and strife in your heart. Oh, 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 the word has a tendency to do these things, doesn't it? Wow, bitter. It cuts. It tastes. It smells. You ever notice? You say, are you saying my heart cuts, tastes, and smells? If you have bitter envying, if you have bitter strife, contention. You got any of that in your heart? <laughs> Lie not against the truth, folks. It is what it is. It comes from where it comes from, and it's a happening that is happening. Lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly. Sensual? Ooh. Devilish? Hang on. Hang on. Because this part you surely don't want to be involved in. For where envying, bitter envying, and bitter strife is, there is confusion and what? And every evil work. What you're doing, if you are in a state of bitter envying and bitter strife, you are opening a door for every evil work. Simple as that. Wow. Well, you don't know. I don't have to know. Have you ever noticed whining to God is not profitable? Nope. Do you know what they've done to me? Do you love them? He said on one occasion. No. I said back, <laughs> are you going to deceive him? Are you going to trick him? No. Would you love him? I looked at that. I cannot do that. Without your help. And he helped. I got whining to him one day about a bunch of preachers. And man, I, they did some unique things. You ever have people do unique things to you? And, and Satan's right there beating on your door, talking to you. And so I was whining to God. 
you know. He says, forget it. <laughs> I mean, he didn't even beat around. Forget it. Forget it. So I forgot it. Do you know what they are this moment? I do not. Because right out here, there's a block somewhere. Now, if I choose to pull at that block, I'm not going there. My firm intent is never to go there. It's been a lot of years since that happened. If you have bitter envy and bitter jealousy, strife, contention in your heart, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where bitter envy and bitter strife is, there is confusion, instability, and disorder. You ever notice? Huh? And every evil work. See, that's one form of wisdom. The second wisdom goes like this. And, but if you, next, next verse. The wisdom that is from above. Notice, notice there's different sources. <laughs> the first one is coming uh, up or somewhere. The wisdom that is from above is first pure, peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. When you're throwing back the barbs, you are not making peace. But, no buts, you see, you're about to modify the instruction. You're about to move over to the other side. But that's not me. I say, bless God, get a change then. Recognize the change that's happened inside you and let it get outside. You are dead to sin. Ooh. Ooh. Wow. There you are. Be free from pretense. As a child of God, the flesh only has the power that you give it. Turf wars would cease with yourself and others. I'm really running out of time. But this is pretty near too good to pass up. Have you guys got a few minutes this morning? Because I want to get through with this. I'll tell you what. Years ago, sitting in a holiness campground, I won't tell you which one, a hole in this campground, talking to the conference superintendent of that particular area of the state, I sat there and began to talk to him about carnality. He said, didn't you ever have any sense? Ruth would say, he'd get in the hole and start digging and just keep digging. It didn't seem to have any ounce of much of caution. So they, talk, they were big on carnality, so I thought we ought to discuss this one. <laughs> it seemed logical to go to the head of the class, you know, so to speak. And in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to read uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, and then go on 12 and 13. Then I'm going to 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9, so basically a repeat. Uh, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's telling them. You come behind in no gift. Oh, boy, Pentecostals grab a hold of that and charismatics and just run wild. Yeah, 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 yeah. I noticed, and I had a whole opening, all dealt with Pentecostals, charismatics, holiness, Calvinists, Wesleyans, Armenians, and so on it went. They all have their traits. They all have things that, that, that they grab a hold of like, like a dog with a bone and shake it to the nth degree, and they're all making mistakes. Well, that's a horrible thing to put out in the air. Have you never made a mistake? Don't think bad of them. There's some good people there. I call them brothers and sisters. I call this guy a brother. I mean, he looked after me in time gone by. He really wanted me as a, a pastor of one of his churches. Mm hmm 
Oh, well. I tell you any more and somebody here, it, they'll be able to tell who it was. So I'll button my lip. Oh, boy. Who shall also confirm you unto the end that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? Don't that sound cool? Blameless. Now, this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, I'm of Paulus, I'm of Cephas, and I have Christ. Have you ever heard that? I mean, we got more ites running around than you can shake a stick at. Ites, you know, ites. In the Old Testament, they had Canaanites and all kinds of ites. Now we got all kinds of ites too. We just don't call them ites. But you can identify them by sticking ites to it or to a particular brand of theology. Ites. Okay. Is Christ divided? What's Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, you can have a Paulite. I could be a Paulite. My dad need never worry. He would never have been a Paulite. Only when I pushed him far enough, he'd use Paul in defense of his position. So I guess momentarily he was a Paulite. Now that would just about make him turn over. <laughs> but him and I had our brisk discussions. We loved one another, but we didn't always see eye to eye. That's not bad. I can love you if you see eye to eye with me or not. You're part of the body of Christ. I'll enjoy you. I will. I'll enjoy you. You got the idea? 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 9. Here, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. You had not grown up. You're ruled by your fleshly senses, your body. You see, they didn't recognize that their body was dead. Ooh, 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 ooh. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. For ye are yet carnal, and whereas there, where, as there is among you envying, bitter envying, let me add, and strife, bitter strife, let me add, and divisions. Ye are carnal and walk as men. And that's what I was talking about to this conference superintendent of this particular denomination of holiness. Because they were death on carnality had no place. And I says, is there any strife here? We sat in the middle of the campground. <laughs> you know, any strife around all these people? He knew better than me. Didn't one of them say, I'm a Paul, one's a Paul? Does, do we say we're of a, of who? Wesley. Oh yes, we're a Wesley. Ah, uh -huh. not Calvin. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Are you carnal? <laughs> that's, what the, that's what the books say. You say, you weren't looking to make any buddies that day. I have never looked to make a lot of buddies. You can say, well, I can see that. Hmm. For one says, I am of Paul, another I am of Paulus, are ye not carnal? You see, it's really down there, God gives the increase, and so on it goes. And we are laborers together with God, and ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. I'm going to share this with you. I shared it in the past, but it's one of those blinding things. I was at a funeral where the man belonged to a full gospel businessman. And then the, the head of the local chapter said, he's baptized in the Holy Ghost, spoken tongues, he had it all. Now, you, can you imagine the alarm bells that went off inside me? Or whatever. But that's Pentecostal charismatics. They are a little far out, aren't they? A little radical. Well, have been one, am one, and was one in the Holiness Church. I got a chance to teach. A, uh, a, 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 I got to teach. They had, a, uh, they had a, what is this, vacation Bible school. They had it at night. For the first time they ever had it at night. And they decided to have an adult class and ask me to teach it. I thought, well, hallelujah. Good. What should we teach? You know what we taught about? The gifts of the Spirit. I figured they didn't know a whole lot about that. 
I was right in the middle of that when this lady piped up down there because she didn't hear the buzzword, holiness. So all she was hearing about was the gifts of the I want to tell you something. Holiness is a fruit. It is not the root. That is what the books say. It is a fruit of righteousness. It is not the root of righteousness. And this individual said, I have holiness. I got it all. I, boy, the alarm bells went off again, but I didn't know what was wrong with it. I did not know what was wrong with that from the end of summer to the next spring. And I, we just, shh, shh. One Sunday, Ruth's family had a, what do you, a family reunion type thing up Traverse City on the Borgman River. And we, I got up there by Leroy on that flat stretch of road somewhere up in that. When all of a sudden, right out of the blue, I heard this. Ruth says, I don't pay much attention to my driving. You know, she says, you're off somewhere else. You're off somewhere else. And I, I'm not told her that sometimes that's partially correct. When out of the blue, here come these words. Remember Peter at the gate. They healed the lame man, or the lame man was healed. Peter says, such I have given to you. In the name of Jesus, rise and walk, grabbed him by the hand, pulled him up, and the guy went leaping and running. Well, that brought the church to a screaming consternation. And his defense was, it's not by our power or holiness that this man walks. Did you hear that? You could have all the holiness in the world and you couldn't make that man walk. You could speak in tongues regularly and still that man might not walk. We have got to get to the point where, yes, I'm holy because the root is holy. Paul would say the seed was holy. And I, amen, bro, that's what you would tell me. I'm born again of the incorruptible seed. When I'm born again, I am created inside holy. When I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I had power. Have. I have the guide into all truth. And so on it goes. But folks, we got to get a hold. We cannot modify the Word of God. We cannot modify it. Uh, throw me up. Romans 6, 1 and 2, one more time. Or how many ever verses you got there. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? <laughs> Don't you just love it? And he goes on and talks about the body. Talks about the likeliness, how it's like Christ's body. Ooh. Ooh. Read it. Read it this week. Father, we thank you that the word of God is truth. The word of God is unshakable from a God that cannot lie. Wow. We enjoy it. It's meaningful to us. It is a rock we hang on to. Oh, yes. Do you want that shared? Ooh. Wow. Are you ready? All of you, are you ready? How many, how many? I won't ask. I've heard it in the past. I'll pull up a chair and sit down. We enter his courts with praise. Is that what it says? Let me ask you a question. Where is his court today? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. It is inside us. So when we go to praise him, where are we looking at? In here. It's not here in the stratosphere. It's here. We enter his courts with praise. Does that do something to you? I have heard of, 
I have been chastised on more than one occasion, or at least I've been a part of those who were being chastised, and probably thinking I was guilty, I probably took it to myself, from praise and worship leaders that keep telling me that I'm not entering into this. I had one say, you just look like you drop out. I said, I do. I do. I go inside. I don't have to listen to things that are not God. Okay? You say, what are you saying? Are you throwing things, stones at praise and worship? No, I'm not. The form of, that which some will say is not a form, but it's a new form. Just different than the old form. You say, you really are on a roll today. I I wasn't the one thought you should bring that up. Look, I'm not against praise and worship. What I want and desire is that we enter his courts and allow the expression to him. He's here. When we pray, we don't have to bring him in from outer space. He's here. He abides. He dwells. When we praise him, he abides. He dwells. We are the temple. We are the whole temple, let alone the court. Do you get that? Now, you can see I don't, this has been around for a while. You see, I don't share everything with you as it rolls in. Awesome, is it not? Awesome. So we're going to praise the Lord. You do it as he leads you. I'll go inside. I'm the temple. I can enter his courts momentarily. Do we understand that? We don't have to wait until some extra special event to be in his presence. His presence is always in us. Oh, my, my, my. I just love that. I just love that. Sasha, 